next time, there were some questions again. So we'll cover the questions. And then uh, you might ask yourself, what the heck are we going to talk about if we're finishing all of Cooperates in two lectures, how can I talk fast enough to finish in lecture two? Well, I can't. So I'm just going to choose a subject or two beyond the questions, and then we'll do that. So the next three lectures um, are more self-contained. Um, I don't think two-dimensional heavy fermions are terribly interesting, but because the Center for Advanced 2D Materials is the one that invited me, I'll of course talk all I can about two-dimensional heavy fermions. Um, mostly they're three-dimensional materials. Um, this, of course, these two are the hot topics. Uh, this is the uh, uh, getting up to the higher TCs. So uh, we're going to end with a bang here. And this is, of course, the, the field I started in back in 1983. So uh, this should be okay. And, and this is going to be personal choice. So there was a question last time or two times ago, what other methods besides the sui kirtley josephson uh, junction uh, triple ring uh, trick is there to detect non-S-wave uh, uh, pairing symmetry? And I'll talk about several of the methods as an answer to that question. So moving right along, we also had a question, because I, I showed this, I had a question from a gentleman who is not here. Um, so, uh, if I look at uh, lanthanum, strontium, or barium, copper oxide, so 214, and I look at the uh, phase diagram, and I do hole doping, so remember in the early view graph we had, had hole doping uh, off on the left and electron doping on the right, so we're constantly looking at hole doping on the right now. Uh, if I look at the TC dome, the superconducting dome, you see it's got this notch, this bite taken out of it, such that at about 1 8 doping level, this is 0 0.125, uh, you will see that, uh, there's no TC. And so you say, what the heck is that? And this is not a well-known fact, um, but here's some details. Uh, they've known it since uh, a couple years after Ben Norge and Mueller published, and it turns out that the, the real notch only works for barium, which of course is what Ben and Mueller were working with. Everyone switched over to strontium because it made uh, uh, better material, but in fact, uh, if you look at the uh, TC dome with strontium doping at the 1 8 uh, filling concentration, there's no big uh, dip, there's just a little notch here. So, uh, you know, here's the anti-ferromagnetic phase sort of drawn schematically. And I just want you to do the numerology. If I take a, a, a row of, of copper oxygen uh, atoms, and I take four of the rows, and on the row I say every copper has a half of a hole, I'll get to my one eighth. So that's the way it works. It's four rows or stripes, that's the word that's used, of uh, copper atoms, uh, every one of which has a half of a hole. So this is hole doping, and so in the whole material, it's one eighth, but on a local picture, it looks like this. So here's a row where every, you know, this is a, this is a, a half of a hole, this is a half of a hole, or you could say this is one hole, this is no hole. But anyway, on average, every copper atom has a uh, half of a hole. And then these stripes or rows of copper atoms separate the uh, rows of the copper atoms with the uh, uh, full doping and the uh, magnetic uh, uh, moments on them. So I've skipped over a couple of things here. So in the barium doped 214, um, at low temperatures, and this is you know, you might ask me why, and I might answer, I don't know, and no one knows. It's, it's something to do with the electronics and lowering the, uh, the uh, uh, total energy for the 
the system, and then an undergraduate could raise their hands and say, but you haven't told me anything. Of course that's the case. Every system goes to its lowest energy state. And why doping with barium gives you a low temperature phase transition where it goes into a tetragonal structure, why that lowers the energy, that's a, a, a DFT band structure calculation. Um, so anyway, in this uh, low temperature tetragonal structure in the copper oxide planes, the uh, orthogonal copper oxide bonds become inequivalent. They're straight in one direction and they're bent in the other. So if I look at um, copper oxygen uh, rows, stripes, uh, and if I look at uh, this copper oxygen plane, uh, I can go uh, this way or I can go this way. So in one direction they'll be straight and the other way they'll be bent. And of course that doesn't show here uh, because this is the high temperature phase diagram. Um, and similarly down here in this copper oxygen plane you would have stripes where uh, uh, in one direction they'd be straight and the other direction they'd be bent. Um, so this inequivalence pins the electronic order and competes with the bulk superconductivity. This causes stripes, and uh, the stripes are 4A apart. Interestingly enough, the existence of stripes or rows of copper atoms where um, the charge order or the charge um, doping was different was actually theoretically predicted by Jan Zahn and, and somebody. Jan is a, uh, a Dutch uh, theorist. Um, a year or two before it was actually experimentally discovered, they got it wrong in the sense that in their picture every copper atom had one hole doped. So they would have been at the uh, quarter uh, doping rather than an eighth. But other than that, they actually predicted the existence of strikes. So um, that's what it looks like. And uh, it turns out that the anti-ferromagnetic um, the, uh, the charge stripes are every 4A apart and uh, serve as uh, separators and the spin lattice repeats every 8 um, uh, lattice units. So I haven't told you anything other than a little bit about it um, and I'm trying to give more references in this talk because there are a lot of things that I'm just going to give you a little bit of and then just like when you go on Wikipedia and you read some article that says this article is a stub, I'm only giving you the, the first start of the story. Uh, John uh, Tranquata, uh, who's at uh, Brookhaven, I believe, uh, wrote a nice long article. If you ever want to learn about uh, charge and spin stripes, um, okay. Uh, you can go to that reference. Uh, and the other thing is, you may not have access to the uh, American Institute of Physics conference proceedings, but you can find it in archive, uh, which is a good trick. If you're having trouble finding something, very often authors will put a preprint out on archive. So if you just search under the author's name and the subject, you can find it in archive where it's uh, free access. And uh, sometimes some publishers, for instance, Taylor and Francis specifically, uh, don't allow uh, open access. Um, and then we had a question about, um, I said pseudogap is primarily a feature of cuprate materials, and I had the person in the audience, who is finally here, uh, uh, say, uh, wait, wait, I've uh, found references where, All right, so ignore the uh, cuprate. This is just a garden variety BCS superconductor. This is what you should learn in your textbooks about superconductivity, what I should have told you on day one, except I didn't. Uh, what happens when you open a gap? So that there's nothing in this gap. Uh, here is a bunch of data, or here are a bunch of data, um, being followed by this line here. In this bottom of this U-shaped, flat-bottomed region, and you can think of this as millivolts, the size of the gap, uh, there are no electrons, and in reality, on the high side, 
it's not occupied at low temperatures, which is, you know, TC for this is 9.2 Kelvin, and these data are about 0.3 Kelvin. So at very, very low temperatures where this gets nice and sharp, the gap is empty, and those states are thrown into being here and being here. Um, and so this is what a BCS superconductor looks like on SDM. Okay, a nice flat bottom U shape. Now what does it look like? And this is conductance, just to point that out. Um, what does the conductance look like, which is obviously the conductance is proportional to the density of states. What does it look like um, when you're stripping states out of the gap and piling them up next door? Um, what does it look like for uh, a non-S wave, non-BCS superconductor? Well, it has two differences. First of all, you can always tell that it's D wave if it looks like a V. Okay, if it looks like a flat bottom U, it's S wave. If it looks like a V, we're talking uh, D wave. However, if you go pay attention to the numbers, this is just yttrium barium copper oxide, which is another way of calling it yttrium one, two, three. If you go look at the numbers, you'll see that this two gap, two delta gap, is not the uh, superconducting fully open gap. This is a pseudo gap. Okay, so we're going to look at the numbers now, right? Don't look skeptical. I'm a truth teller. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take the distance between these so-called coherence peaks on each side of the gap, and we're going to look at what the numbers are. So, um, it just taking uh, a ruler and remembering what the uh, cables on TC is, if I take two delta I'm assuming it's a pseudo gap, but ahead of time I don't really necessarily know that. But two times whatever that gap between the coherence peaks is, divided by k volts on temperature, I get 4.8, which is not a D wave answer. Um, that's uh, too too large. And so the answer is is just like in this picture here, and again I'm not doing YBCO, I just drew a picture in here for 214. Um, what's happening is the superconducting gap is some size, and at higher temperatures, there's a pseudo gap that's uh, present. So the pseudo gap is larger, and so I just want to point out that when you do um, STM on a superconductor, and you get a number that's too big, what you're doing is you had another way to measure the pseudo gap, you know, where the resistivity has a, a, a drop off in slope. We we showed that where the specific heat. Had a, had a drop off of the intercept, we showed that, uh, where the NMR has a, uh, a drop off in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the T1, we showed that. And so now we have a fourth method for looking at the pseudo gap. It's looking at the STM. So now to the gentleman's question, what about pseudo gaps in things that are cuprates? Well, I now present you published data with no comment as to whether you should believe it or not. So this is islands of just lead. This isn't anything special. This is an S-wave superconductor. Um, the islands are small, but not totally small. Uh, the transition temperature has been affected somewhat. Here's the, the uh, conductivity, uh, where it goes to zero down here. Um, rather broadened. So if I look way below or somewhat below TC, I get, as you see, uh, a big dip in the middle, not flat, getting worried here. Uh, coherence peaks, that's good. So we sort of see behavior that you might associate uh, below TC with uh, scanning tunneling microscopy. And as I get warmer, you see, even though I'm below TC here at 6 Kelvin, I see no coherence peaks. So the two things you're looking for, one of them's missing. But people that do STM says, say, hey, here is a dip in the density of states. This is the, the conductance. Here is a dip in the density of states around zero. This is like an opening of a gap. Well. 
Within the pseudogap community, the answer to that is yes. Okay, people who do STM and pseudogaps, to them this is a lead pipe cinch. This is a hundred percent proof of the opening of a pseudogap. I would be happier if we saw some other kinds of measurement, but that's okay. Uh, at least in uh, the STM world, if you stay within that literature, you can find pseudogaps in lots of things. Where the pseudogap is defined as a partial decrease in the electronic density of states um, below some certain temperature. Um, we'll see more about this pseudogap discussion um, next time when we talk about uh, hyperparameters. Because now that I've had this question raised, I now have to find pseudogaps in everything. I mean, if you can find a pseudogap in lead, I think the, the, the definition of pseudogap has been stretched a bit. But that's OK. Um, so we're going to start sort of the main part of the lecture. And then we're going to do another digression to answer a question. And then we're going to finish the main part of the lecture. OK, so um, young guy, old guy. Uh, we'll talk about some interesting history of how they discovered this. Um, we haven't really talked about the isotope effect much, so I just wanted to remind you if there is an isotope effect, which for instance in the iron base there is, but it's, you know, like in the, in the cuprates you could look at an isotope effect for the oxygen uh, replacement by, uh, instead of uh, O16 you can use O18. Uh, you can look at uh, copper, or you can use copper 63, copper 65, uh, which is not a big difference in, in the mass. Um, so you look at isotope effects on various uh, sublattices, and if you look at the uh, iron-based superconductors, uh, there is an isotope effect on the iron because it's the iron spin fluctuations that are supposedly causing the superconductivity, and so you can see an effect on the lattice vibrations of the iron affecting those spin fluctuations. So the fact that you see an isotope effect need not say that it's electron phonon coupling that causes the superconductivity. All it's saying is, is that vibrations of that species, iron in the iron base or copper oxygen here, that vibrations of that species might enhance some other kind of pairing. I hope that was clear. Okay? So, um, if you change the vibrational frequency of the iron atoms, you're going to change the, the spin correlation uh, pairing between that and the neighboring irons. And so, the electron phonon isotope effect that you see on iron isn't saying that it's an electron phonon BCS pairing. It's saying that those uh, lattice interactions affect the dominant pairing interaction. So that's a caveat, a warning. So if you go to optimally dope, please, I know I'm saying a lot and, and, and sometimes I go too fast, but please remember I'm talking about optimally doped at the top of the superconducting dome. If I talk about optimally doped, there's just no isotope. It's just zero within their error bar, okay? However, there is a measurably finite isotope effect in 214, which I've stated before. So there is some clear evidence that there is a uh, BCS pairing mechanism here. If you go to underdope cuprates, and the easy way in if you're bearing copper oxide is instead of having oxygen 7, you get out of oxygen 6.6 .6 or something, you get a, a suppressed TC, and then you can find finite um, uh, isotope effect uh, exponents. And this is understood as electron phonon coupling enhancing some other form of pairing. So don't get excited if you find an isotope effect. It might not necessarily be the smoking gun for BCS superconductivity, or it might. Here is just something I could not resist putting in this lecture. This is a one slide, totally not connected to the
the previous slides or the slides that come afterwards, we talked about looking for time reversal uh, symmetry breaking as evidence for unconventional superconductivity because that would say that the, uh, the, the Cooper pairs have a magnetic moment uh, which would break time reversal uh, symmetry. It turns out that in YBCO, you see uh, a polar Kerr effect, but it's not a TC, it's below. So where the pairing starts, it's uh, not showing a polar Kerr, Kerr effect. So that is not proof of unconventional superconductivity, which is sort of interesting. Um, okay, so there was another question. This is my last question from a previous lecture that I'm answering in this lecture. Um, from Yvonne, I believe. What are some other methods for showing non-S wave pairing symmetry? And we talked about the Sui Kirtley method, uh, which is horribly complicated. Is there some easier way? Well, it's all hard. So I measure specific heat for a living, and let's talk about that as a, as a method. So the specific heat, specifically the electronic term divided by temperature as you extrapolate to low temperatures in the superconducting state. If you're looking at uh, C over T, C electronic over T, below TC as T goes to zero, if you have a fully open gap, that's zero, period. But if you don't fully open the gap, if you have some parts on the gap where there are zeros in the gap, so the gap's not fully open, a la this picture here. So suppose I take a cylinder in the C direction coming out of the page, and I have a dx squared minus y squared pairing symmetry, so I have these, these lobes on my uh, pairing symmetry, they come out to have uh, four line nodes on the cylinder coming up in the C direction in K space um, where the gap goes to zero, okay? So the statement here is the specific heat in the superconducting state, and it's the electronic specific heat, not the lattice term, if you look at the electronic specific heat in the superconducting state, you can get an idea if there are nodes. That sounds straightforward. But it's harder than that. So the claim is, and we'll talk about this, that this, this electronic term in the specific heat in the superconducting state, this is not in the normal state, this is in the superconducting state, goes as the square root of field if and then we'll talk about if there are line nodes. So here is a BCF superconductor, 18 Kelvin, uh, TC. And this is T squared, it's hard to read, but this is like uh, four point some Kelvin, so we're way below TC. If you look at the superconducting state at this term as a function of field, so I look at the specific heat as a function of field in this field, 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 and I take the intercept at t equals zero, that is my gamma as a function of field, okay? So my gamma, my electronic term divided by temperature as a function of field, this is what I get. And if I plot it versus H for a BCS superconductor, I get a straight line. Because all this is, for those of you who studied superconductivity and didn't just on lecture one, all this is, is this is the mixed state. You get some normal regions, you get some superconducting regions. When this field gets up to HC2, you should run into the normal state gamma because that's all you're doing. You know, you get some normal state, some superconducting state, and the mixed state in a type 2 superconductor. And when you get up to uh, HC2, you should get the right gamma. Okay? So that's, that's not rocket science. That's just how it ought to work in a BCS superconductor. So I see no square root of H here. Everybody's happy that that's linear gamma in the superconducting state versus field linear. I have three ten, which we saw the data for vanadium three silicon. Okay. So all of these more complicated ways of figuring out uh, pairing symmetry go back to theory. This is a theory from Volovic. Uh, he pointed out that if you're in a superconductor with line nodes, there's a Doppler shift of the uh, quasi-particle excitation spectrum. And this Doppler shift is pretty big. It's of the order, in the neighborhood of the nodes at least, it's of the order of the energy gap. And therefore, 
this Doppler shift strongly alters the density state. And unless you're clumsy, you ought to be able to see that in this specific heat. Okay? So that's another method for showing nodes. And if you see nodes, there are examples of S-like pairing symmetry. It's called S plus minus in the, in the ion-based uh, superconductors. Um, but it's not conventional superconductivity. Okay, so that's another way besides so we currently, um, you can also use the thermal conductivity because the thermal conductivity of a, of a metal depends on the electronic density of states, okay? So I'm not trying to sell you that this is easy. This is terribly hard. So we'll, we'll see a little bit of why it's terribly hard. So uh, if you're going to compare to Volovic's theory, there are two limiting regimes. No field and very low temperature, and no temperature and very low field. Now, obviously, you can't get here, so you have to extrapolate. But in those two limits, okay, in the zero field limit at low temperatures, the electronic term should go as T squared. Now, if it's a uh, superconductor, you expect a gap to open, you expect it to go as some exponential. So this is certainly different. The problem is, when you fill in the constants for how big this coefficient should be, it's small. And it's really tough to see it. And um, there has been argument in the literature um, over these data since they were published. Uh, Junot in uh, uh, Geneva um, made some rather cutting comments about how this was oversimplified. Uh, and I won't go into that because I'm friends with both, uh, well, I, I know Catherine Moeller anyway, I couldn't have a friend, and I know uh, uh, Alain, as you know, who's since retired. But anyway, it's not easy, okay? Um, so that's one way, if you can find a T-squared term. And the problem is, if you look at cuprates, you might remember there was some anti-ferromagnetism in the phase diagram. So if you look at the low temperature specific heat and you've got an imperfect crystal, which for all of you theorists out there are the only kind that exists, there is no such thing as a perfect crystal. There's always going to be defects. And those defects in a system where in the phase diagram there's magnetism nearby, those defects are going to be potentially magnetic. Okay? So, um, those magnetic defects will show up in your low temperature specific heat as an upturn because there's going to be some entropy associated with those magnetic defects. And so it's really hard to get a clean sample uh, and people fight over clean samples. Um, and then if you start putting a magnetic field on and you've got some magnetic defects, then you're really dead because things move around according to how the magnetic defect responds to the field rather than the uh, volumetric uh, uh, Doppler shifting uh, around the nodes. So uh, if you're in this other limit, very low field and very low temperature, you get this behavior, which is the advertised behavior. Okay? Um, and actually, it sounds like I'm hiding something, but this is actually the part of Volovic's argument that's the easiest to understand. When you read his paper, this part of the discussion is actually quite easy. Now, instead of D-wave, have this S plus minus pairing where you also get nodal behavior. And there's a big, big, big argument uh, between a Japanese theorist and the rest of the world about whether the iron based are S plus minus or S plus plus. And I will not enter into that argument. Um, but anyway, so the old data where gamma goes as square root of H, which got published in Physical Letters, didn't know about all these complexities. It was just sort of Here's the Volovic uh, theory. You know, Volovic theory was uh, 93. Boom, boom, here it is in a decent great, uh, sample of uh, YBCO. Um, but this, is, this has been called into question. It's not this easy. If you want to read further on this, you can look at one of our papers at PRV where we worked really hard to get it right in potassium dope, barium, uh, iron 2, arsenic 2. And if you want to go read about the complications, there it is. Okay, 
so for having been so patient with all these different answer this question, answer that question, lead as a pseudogam on my aching brain, I thought I'd give you some fun. How is it that Ben and Mueller found this stuff? We've all heard part of the story. Um, how did we manage to get up here on this pinnacle? It's an interesting story. Uh, and and did, I, did I have any undergrads who stuck it out or they all got it? Oh, okay. You can tell the other guys they missed something today. Okay. Um, it turns out that the English word perseverance is very important. You gotta stick to it. Um, so um, the cuprates occur in the perovskite structure, and I've never used that term. I've just shown you pictures of what the structure looks like. But um, it turns out that Alex Mueller was an expert in this kind of field. So the reason he chose these structures to look for high temperature superconductivity, which he was doing, he was honestly looking for high temperature superconductivity, is because he was an expert in the field, right? So, um, before we zip off on Ben Norge Mueller, what was the previous pathway? Well, BCS theory predicts this. This is some average uh, phonon frequency. This is the electronic density states of the Fermi energy. And this is something to do with the electron phonon coupling strength. So if you have a large denominator, then you have e, e to the minus a smaller number. E to the minus a smaller number gives a bigger multiplier times this gives a bigger TC. Okay? Now, there is, there are people, Warren Pickett, who did a sabbatical here in 2014, I think, um, has an archive paper and, and it's, it's fairly common in the literature where the, the high temperature superconductivity, which is room temperature in Antarctica, just I should point this out, room temperature superconductivity has been achieved um, in hydrogen, excuse me, hydrogen 3 sulfide at 2 megabar, just in case you're not good with metric units when they're that big, that's 2 megabar. Uh, when we were doing uh, production of niobium 3 silicon in the A15 structure, and we were using um, plastic explosives down in the canyon, the explosive pressure that the shockwave supposedly reached was one megabar. Okay, so two megabars is an enormous pressure. You can't reach it with, uh, with explosives, okay? Well, I'm not a big expert on explosives, but I, I think it's really hard to do. So they do this in these designer diamond anvil cells. Um, so, but the belief is that this is BCS, and Ellie Ashberg is strong coupling BCS, haven't mentioned that so much either. Uh, the belief is that these new efforts, and I got an email from a collaborator in a high pressure group where we gave them a, not to be revealed, uh, material with light atoms in it, not to be revealed. Um, so far negative results unfortunately, up to uh, over a megabar. I think 113 GPA is how high the grad student has gotten so far. So in our efforts, we haven't seen it, but there's a big effort out there. Okay, so this is a discussion in the community about whether BCS can go to high TC. Ignoring that, we're gonna go, what was Ben Norge and Mueller's approach for reaching high TC? So, the, these are quotes I've lifted from their discovery paper in Zeitschrift for Physique in 1986, okay? And this is based on uh, Carl Alex Mueller's expertise. Oxides like perovskites can exhibit superconductivity, like lithium titanate, I believe was the example they used, despite their small carrier concentration. So remember, BCS pathway to high TC was high density states, right? get a big number down in the denominator that makes e to the minus a smaller number, bigger multiplier times this, gives you this. So according to Pickett, the reason they're getting uh, ITC is because the average excitation frequency for the hydrogen, because it's such a light atom, is very high, right? So that's where they're coming from. Uh, Bednarz, well actually, Mueller was saying, 
I'm not going to go look for high densities of states. I'm going to look in another nook and cranny in material space. Um, further from their paper, strong electron phonon interactions in oxides can occur owing to polaron formation. So everyone that studied the discovery of high TC remember, remembers that Mueller's theory was it was polarons that were going to give high TC strong coupling. So let's talk about his theory. Remember, it's wrong. They looked in the right place for the wrong reason and made the discovery and got the Nobel Prize. So just remember, you don't have to be all right. You just have to be enough partially right. Okay? Um, so here is how the polaron pairing mechanism works. So way back when, and this is also cited in the uh, Ben Norris Mueller discovery paper, there was a guy named Karl Heinz Kirk, who used to work at Augsburg when I was there, um, who came up with the idea um, that if you have a Jan Teller distortion, so the Jan Teller theorem, this is actually Edward Teller, the, the Austrian physicist, if you, if you look at the Jan Teller theorem, any nonlinear molecule with a spatially degenerate electronic ground state will distort to remove that degeneracy and lower the overall energy, okay? And her came up with the idea that if you go into a material with such a structural distortion that you can form polarons. So that was Herc's contribution, okay? Moving, okay, here's a polaron. Just the idea how this is different than an electron moving through the lattice and um, distorting the lattice and leaving behind a lattice excitation that then in a retarded sense acts upon the next electron. The way a polaron works is a polaron distorts the lattice in a non-symmetrical fashion. So that's the difference between just an electron going through and pulling all the positive lattice ions towards it, which then, like a, um, a ball distorting a, a mattress, leaves a depression in the separation in the, in the positive ions, which is then seen by a successor electron going through the lattice. What a polaron is talking about is this electron pulls the positive lattice ions out and, uh, and the blue ones are the negative, I know it's very hard to see, and pushes those apart. And so the trick in a polaron distortion of the lattice is a Jan Teller polaron, and this can be some ionic crystal or some semiconductor or insulator. Um, it distorts the lattice in a non-symmetrical fashion. So that's the, the difference with the polaron. Jan Teller polarons, again, this is based on, on Hooke's uh, paper in 83, can have a much stronger, higher characteristic energy than the standard electron phonon coupling. So put that in the prefactor of the BCS formula, and off you go to higher TC. Ben Norris and Mueller theorized that the formation of such Jan Teller polarons could be expected at a metal insulator phase boundary in mixed perovskites. So everyone sort of insults the fact that Kava had to come along and make phase pure lanthanum strontium copper oxide. Ben Norris and Mueller mixed up their phases on purpose. On purpose. They wanted mixed phase perovskites so they could sneak up on this Jan Teller distortion in one of the phases present at the metal insulator phase boundary, okay? And the other piece of, of, of theory that they based their idea on was this theory paper from Chakraverti that proposed an insulator superconductor transition due to polarons enhancing the electron phonon coupling. That, in a nutshell, is what Ben Norge and Mueller were looking for. Polaronic superconductivity. Bigger characteristic energies, bigger TC. Forget about the low density states. They didn't care. You know, if they make the prefactor big, maybe they can get away from screwing up the exponent, which normally dominates. So, they started off looking in the wrong place. I'll get to that. But this is the, 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 the payment for listening to all the 
the answers to questions. This is uh, this is sort of interesting, particularly if you're an experimentalist. So uh, their system had actually three phases, and they, they did the X-rays. They knew what they had, and what they were looking for was it was known by Carl Alex Mueller that uh, if you had mixed valent copper two plus and copper three plus ions surrounded by octahedra of oxygen atoms, which occurs, as we've seen in the cuprate structure, or otherwise known as the perovskite structure, this would show a jan teller distortion. That's Herb's idea. jan teller distortion causing a polaron, then you go off to Chaco Verti, and so hopefully the jan teller distortion in this mixed valence system would uh, cause a polaron, and hopefully that would go off to higher coupling strength and make uh, higher TC cooper pairs, Chakravarti's idea, okay? And it must have been hard to walk around being Carl Heinz Herb after the discovery paper three years down the road from your theory paper said, what a great theory paper, this is really great, this caused us to have a Nobel Prize idea. I mean, it must have, hard, must have been hard to be humble. I mean, that's a success. Okay? So here we go. If you read, and there's this really nice, chatty paper by Ben Norge, who was actually the one in the lab doing the work, but he and Mueller worked together closely because Mueller was the one that had the idea and the insight. If you read the details of the search, they were looking in the wrong place. They were looking at another place where you have Jan Teller distortions in oxygen octahedra, they were looking at lanthanum uh, nicolate where you had lanthanum 3 plus rather than the copper 2 plus, okay? So they were looking in the wrong place and it wasn't working and uh, they tried to tune the bandwidth by replacing the nickel with aluminum, it wasn't working. Um, they tried to tune uh, the, the bandwidth uh, by replacing lanthanum with yttrium, it wasn't working, and they had mostly given up. Things slowed down, they weren't in the lab very much, but Ben Norge, being a stubborn future Nobel laureate, <laughs> kept thinking, and he saw an article on some bizarre compound. So the other people that can walk around feet, uh, with swelled heads would be the people that published this off in some uh, journal. Um, and, and, and this seemed to, to Ben Norge, well, he, he knew from Mueller that copper 2 plus could also have a Jan Teller distortion and might also be making polarons. Um, so since this hadn't worked and they really had finished everything they possibly could think of, he said, well, let's work on a copper uh, 2 plus, 3 plus mixed valence and I can tune it by uh, burying the barium with the lanthanum. So this is where their, their lanthanum barium copper oxide idea came from, from this compound. So they said, well, or Ben Norris said, let's try copper instead of nickel, and uh, they tuned the bandwidth this way. First sample, 11 Kelvin TC. Two weeks later, 35 Kelvin TC, done. So the next time you get depressed that your idea is not working, maybe work a little longer. You might find something worth one of. So this is a really an impressive uh, <coughs> tribute to perseverance. And uh, it's nice to have support from your uh, parent institute where you get to go off in strange, direction, strange directions. So next time we're going to talk about heavy fermions. Uh, they started in 1979. They're low TC materials. People have argued since the beginning of, of cuprates well, if we work on heavy fermions, we can understand things a little better because the characteristic energies are so much smaller. They're not 100 Kelvin, they're 1 Kelvin. And uh, we can uh, do better theory and, and uh, we have a much broader selection of materials. They're somewhat easier to make, although when I start talking next week, I'll tell you how hard this one was. This, again, took more than a year to get right. The interesting thing from most people's point of view is the effective masses are quite large. People typically write a thousand here. A thousand has never been measured. That's just theory. Uh, numbers in excess of 100 and less than 200 have been measured by de Haussmann-Alpin. So it's a big number times the rest mass of an electron. 
Remember the effective mass of electrons in gold is something like 0.6 rest mass of an electron. So normal conducting metals have things actually usually a little less than one for a, 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 an M star for an effective mass, less than one times the rest mass. Uh, they're clearly unconventional, they're clearly non-BCS, and for those of you who are getting tired of hearing about D-Wave, uranium platinum 3 is F-Wave. 